Let me say before I begin that uh, it's okay with me if you just came for the free food. I'm glad you're here anyway. Uh, I'm very excited uh, to, be, uh, to be here. And I want to thank uh, Tom McCall, Jeffrey Fulkerson, Chul Chop, and the rest of the staff of the Henry Center for inviting me here and facilitating my lecture today. Thanks are due as well to David Louie and Doug Sweeney, both of whom are very high on my list of best friends and most treasured theological conversation partners. I also suspect they had something to do with my being invited here today. As mentioned, I am an alumnus of this wonderful institution, and I once had the privilege of studying with several professors who are still on faculty now, especially John Woodbridge, as well as some others who have, alas, passed on to their reward. I remember fondly, for example, the amazing Gleason Archer. Yes, he controlled 26 languages, as well as the gently erudite and godly Walter Liefeld. And unless I'm mistaken, I was a student in one of the first systematic theology classes taught by a remarkably young professor with jet black hair, as I recall, who had just returned stateside following the completion of his doctoral studies at Cambridge, one Kevin Van Hooser. Perhaps you've heard of him? These past associations and treasured friendships suggest some of the reasons why I am delighted to be here today and why I consider myself not among, among not just friends, but also fellow pilgrims. And even more, as the late Richard John Newhouse might have reminded us, we here together, we evangelicals and Catholics, need one another. In the present bewildering cultural moment, that observation <coughs> applies more than ever. The need for evangelic, evangelical Catholic solidarity, moreover, is nowhere more acute than in the doctrine of creation. Consider for a moment the gravity of some of the questions pressing upon us today. Is our world, our cosmos, merely an unfathomably vast and violent sphere of random material processes, one that began with a big bang, but will likely end with a whimper in the big freeze, as contemporary astrophysics and cosmology suggest? Or is it, as long Christian tradition holds, an arena within which we human beings can rightly discern the love and reason of our creator? Is the realm of what we used to call nature, in fact, nothing more than a system of chance arrangements and one which we, with our increasing mastery of nature's secrets, may manipulate to pursue our own ends? Is the human creature merely the in product du jour of blind natural processes, destined soon to be outdone as futurists like Ray Kurzweil insist in a post-human future when some of us apparently get to live forever? And is the old fashioned binary according to which humankind is divided into two sexes a notion we seem to take for granted until just about last week, in reality, nothing more than a smokescreen for the deployment of a narrative of heteronormativity, a power move which obscures the sexual indeterminacy of the human being apart from social and cultural forces. If our own bodies are, as many now seem to believe, infinitely plastic forms that we may remold at whim then is nothing in our world truly given in the sense of a gift received from a giver? By the way, the nearly infinite set of designer genders one could derive from the image shown here, which is used to train graduate students at Marquette <coughs> University, brings with it, we should have known this, right? An equally vast number of marketing opportunities the latest steps in the sexual revolution can thus be portrayed not only as a victory for individual freedom, but as a win for American business as well. These questions and many others like them are not only difficult, I believe, but also destined to cause a great deal of trouble for traditional Christian believers. If in today's world we insist on giving answers to them that are informed by our faith and consistent with scripture and Christian tradition, 
answers that will surely differ from what our now globalized technocratic culture expects and increasingly requires, then these answers will in coming years cost us dearly. As we Christians claim and proclaim the doctrine of creation and attempt to live in accord with it, we will experience not only increasing cognitive dissonance with our friends and neighbors, not to mention business and government, but outright persecution and suffering as well. There is no health and wealth gospel, I fear, beckoning to us from the far side of a recovery of the doctrine of creation, at least not before the suffering and persecution have been endured. In the long run, I am, as a friend of mine recently put it, cautiously pessimistic. <laughs> but in the long run, we Christians have no choice but to be maximally hopeful, living out, as Pope Francis put it in his first encyclical letter, the joy of the gospel. The doctrine of creation, too, is good news, and we have every reason to hope that many will come to see it as such. The combination of long-term gospel joy with, short -term, with the short-term recognition that the world as fallen is an arena of suffering and loss is precisely what I'm after in today's lecture. And I mean to go looking for it in the theology of creation as found in the work of one of the most original thinkers in the long Catholic tradition, the great Martin Luther. Specifically, I want to take up the elder Martin Luther's reading of the narrative of creation in Genesis 1 and 2 and probe it for approaches to the creation that will be helpful for readers of the Bible, priests, pastors, lay people, you name it, today. How can Luther's reading of the narrative of the creation help us see and experience the joy of the gospel? To find out, I plan to lead you on a journey with four parts. First, I need to tell you a little bit about Martin Luther as a reader of the Bible. Some recent trends in biblical scholarship, particularly the new perspective on Paul, have led many to dismiss Luther as a conversation partner for theology and exegesis today, and I want to push back against that a bit. Secondly, I want to fill in some background reading, background regarding Luther's abiding interest in the book of Genesis. Next, I will sketch out for you the ancient cosmology of Aristotle and Ptolemy, which formed what we might call the superstructure of Luther's worldview. Finally, and I hope you're not worn out by then, I will turn to Luther's reading of the creation narrative. My argument will be that Luther, Luther's was a Catholic cosmology. And by that, I mean something very specific, namely that Luther's way of reading both nature and nature's God stands in fundamental continuity with the broad Catholic tradition in the Latin West, a tradition that affirms both reason and faith, nature and grace. As we will see, however, there are some peculiarities in Luther's views of those matters, and these very peculiarities render his reading of the created order anything but conventional. The Catholic cosmology of Luther is, I hope to show, both fascinating and useful. One caveat, I will in what follows raise more questions than I have time to answer. But if my lecture leaves you wanting to know more, then I will have achieved at least part of my purpose. It cannot be denied that Luther was one of the greatest biblical expositors in the long Christian tradition. I thought I would just say that like that with a period at the end, boom, just like that. <laughs> Consider the scope of his work on the Bible. First, he was the son of pious middle-class German Christian parents who had him baptized the day after his birth. They took him to church regularly as a boy where he heard sermons that seemed to have reflected the distinctive northern German piety of his mother's family, the Lindemans. Thus he was formed as a believer by the so-called Frömmigkeitstheologie, a theology for piety of the later Middle Ages, an informal movement or trend among the rising German middle class that was making it possible for lay people to live something like the pious life hitherto reserved only for the religious, that is, for monks and nuns. It seems as well that Luther was taught the catechism, particularly the Ten Commandments, at home, and mostly by his father. 
who not surprisingly emphasized the fourth commandment, honor your father and your mother. Luther was immersed from the very beginnings in a way of life near the center of which stood the church and her holy scriptures. As a young man, he did his university studies in the city of Erfurt. After having earned the bachelor's and master's of arts degrees, he began the study of law per his father's wishes. Only a few weeks later, however, Luther left off his studies, said a quick goodbye to friends, forsook the world, and presented himself as a candidate for admission to the monastic life in the Augustinian order in Erfurt. Luther lived as an Augustinian friar for about 18 years, and as such, he prayed the hours with his monastic confreres many times a day. As many monks before him had also done, Luther all but memorized the Psalms, and he became intimately familiar with the rhythms of Scripture, the Old Testament, and the New. After his ordination as a priest, the young father Luther was, ordained, was ordered by his monastic superiors to undertake the study of theology, and between 1507 and 1512, he earned the standard advanced degrees, the Bachelor of Bible, the Master of the Sentences, and the Doctor of Theology degree. By the way, this is precisely the same academic pedigree as a guy named Thomas Aquinas almost 300 years earlier. He then became professor of theology, teaching the Bible, in the recently founded university in a relatively remote German hamlet, Little Wittenberg, on the Elbe River. Over the course of a 33-year career at Wittenberg, Luther lectured through most of the Bible. But his focus after 1518 fell mostly upon the, the Old Testament. In addition, Father Luther also became prior of the, Augustinian of the community of Augustinians, the Black Friars, where his duties included supervising a number of smaller Augustinian houses. He filled his spare time with regular priestly duties in Wittenberg's churches, typically preaching several times a week, as well as hearing confessions and celebrating the Mass. In all these duties, of course, Scripture played an important part. Luther's world was thoroughly steeped in the Bible. During his years of study, he also found time to teach himself New Testament Greek, and before long, he had gained a basic knowledge of Hebrew as well. In those days, priests and theologians skilled in the former language, and especially the latter, were still relatively rare. Then in 1517, Luther got himself into a little hot water with an unintentionally incendiary publication that became known as the 95 Theses. By 1521, he'd been excommunicated from the church and then tried and convicted of a capital crime and sentenced to death. With a little help from his friends, he found safety at the, near, at the remote Wartburg Castle. But what to do there? Naturally, he busied himself with letters to friends and supporters, but he worked steadily as well at producing postals, collections of model sermons to be used by parish priests and a complete German translation of the New Testament, the first of its kind. The latter appeared for the first time in September 1522, hence the moniker September Testament. Following his return to Wittenberg earlier, earlier that same year, Luther had resumed his biblical lectures as well as his regular preaching duties. In addition, he continued translation work on the Bible and in the 1520s produced a steady stream of translations of the Old Testament books until finally in 1534, as you see here on uh, your right-hand side, the first complete Luther Bible, so-called, was published. If the scriptures are a forest, he boasted, then I've shaken every tree. But what about his hermeneutics, you may be wondering? Yes. What about that? <laughs> yes, I looked at you, Kevin. Well, Luther came of age as a theologian and exegete during a period, okay, a few hundred years, in which exegetes were increasingly turning to the literal sense of scripture rather than to the allegorical or figural sense. Later medieval biblical scholars had increasingly found themselves on a quest, as it were, to vindicate, as Chris Ocker has put it, the full spirituality of the letter. Luther himself always retained a deep sense of the internal rhythms and intertextual harmonies in Holy Scripture, but like his contemporaries, he wanted to find the real riches of biblical meaning in the literal sense, which for him meant what we might call the story level of the text. At the same time, Luther also identified Jesus Christ, 
as narrated in the ecumenical creeds as the central content of the scriptures as a whole. Confronted with a text that just wouldn't seem to yield up its edifying fruit, Luther would, as he put it, hurl Christ at it, just as Moses once struck the rock with his staff and so brought forth the living water. The real meaning of scripture for Luther is vas Christum tribet, namely that which promotes the saving Christ. Obviously, the scope of Luther's work on the Bible is both broad and deep, so he surely knew all of it very well. It is somewhat surprising, given Luther's much vaunted Paulinism, to learn that he spent most of his time as an exegete reading and interpreting the Old Testament. New Testament lectures at Wittenberg after 1520 were offered by his younger colleague, the Greek Wunderkind, Philip Melanchthon. With Luther's focus on the Old Testament, we find also within Luther's focus on the Old Testament, we also find a narrower focus on the book of Genesis. It is unclear how many times Luther may have lectured on the book, whether, as I believe, twice or three times, as some evidence suggests. In any case, the Weimar critical edition of Luther's writings includes two sets of lectures, actually one set of sermons, one set of lectures, each of which eventually appeared in published form. The sermons date from 1523 to 24, when Luther, despite his excommunication and imperial condemnation at the Diet of Worms, was still wearing his Augustinian habit still identifying himself publicly as an Augustinian. These sermons were published in German and Latin editions in 1527 and appear to have influenced the emerging Protestant exegesis of Genesis, particularly that of Johannes Ecolampadius in uh, Basel, Switzerland. Given these important early publications on Genesis, it is curious that Luther turned back to it yet again late in his career. Indeed, beginning in 1535, Luther delivered what would turn out to be his lengthiest and his last lectures on any book of the Bible. In fact, this is Luther's longest work. These lectures run about 2,500 massive folio pages in the original Latin, and they comprise the first eight volumes, try reading that, the first eight volumes in the American edition. One thing I've learned studying history of exegesis of Genesis, don't write a commentary on Genesis. I'm, I'm sorry, some of you, I'm sure, have already done this. But the, the, the way is littered with the bodies of many who tried to uh, write a commentary all the way through Genesis, and you know they peter out somewhere around you know chapter five, eleven, eighteen, you know somewhere they just kind of that's it. Uh, <laughs> Luther managed to make it through the whole thing, right? Why? Why Genesis? In part, it was the story of the the stories of the patriarchal households, in which he found a biblical paradigm for the households of the godly. The married estate became in Luther's exegesis and in his own life the new and indeed the true religious life. Abraham and Sarah and the generations who followed after them became on Luther's understanding great heroes of faith, men and women who lived faithfully in a fallen world and who faced the contradictions of sin, death and the devil with their ears steadily turned to the God who had promised a savior. In addition, of course, one also finds in the text of Genesis, protology, first things, original order, man and woman, the household as such, and the creation of this good earth, as well as the formation of the heavens. What did Luther have to say about that? As might well be the case with many of us, a good deal of what the elder Luther had to say about the creation of the heavens and the earth reflected what he had learned years earlier in school. You and I were probably taught something about evolution and a little about the Big Bang, but what was Luther taught? It turns out that just as the medievals had the sentences of Peter Lombard to teach the basics of theology, so also they had a book to teach the basics of cosmology. The book, On the Sphere. The author, one of my all-time favorites, the Englishman John of Hollywood. I like to say Hollywood, but it's really Hollywood. <laughs> John Hollywood it just seems like a great name for a medieval theologian, don't you think? <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> okay. He was known to history as Sacrobosco, which is the Latinized form of his name. 
Sacrobosco's work offered a precis and explication of the cosmology that had first been developed in Aristotle's Decaolo, which set a fixed spherical Earth within a system of concentric circles around which moved the heavenly bodies. Want to see a picture? <laughs> this is actually a 17th century slide, but uh, it, it gets the classical cosmology. For Aristotle, the universe comprises two regions, the sublunar and the supralunar. The sublunar sphere is marked by flux and change, understood as the imperfect interactions of the four basic elements. From heaviest to lightest, they are earth, water, air, and fire. The supralunar region, by contrast, is a realm of perfection and permanence. Mercury, Venus, the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and lastly, the fixed stars move in perfect circles made of ether or quintessence from the Latin quinta essentia, fifth element. I like that. They rotate from east to west at constant rates of speed, and they do so eternally. The heavens are thus unchanging. The outermost sphere in this system is the source of the motion found in each of those below it. Thus, it is the prime or unmoved mover. Because of their increasing proximity to this first mover, the heavenly bodies move at higher rates of speed as one moves upward from the Earth. Aristotle's cosmos, in short, is a wonder, both physically and aesthetically. As one might guess, the structure of Aristotle's universe was drawn at least as much from deduction as from observation, and it was through observation that his system was seen to be incorrect or at least incomplete. For example, it proved difficult to reconcile the observed motion of the heavenly bodies with Aristotle's conviction that the circles of ether, ether were perfectly concentric. The problem of eccentric or out of round motion was just one issue addressed in the great cosmological work of Ptolemy of Alexandria, the Almagest, which offered elegant mathematical solutions to problems with the Aristotelian model, including eccentric motion. This text put the Aristotelian cosmos on sounder footing by adding in astronomical observations and resolving some of its internal difficulties by means of mathematical calculation. Ptolemy's work even made possible relatively accurate predictions of the motions of the heavenly bodies, including the dramatic moment of an eclipse. Whatever its shortcomings may have been, the Ptolemaic system seemed to work. Luther's cosmos, then, was not that of Copernus, Copernicus, still less of Galileo, but instead that of Ptolemy, Aristotle, and long medieval tradition. Sacrobosco's explication of the Aristotelian Ptolemaic system was standard reading in European universities for more than 300 years. Written at the University of Paris, where the author taught natural philosophy, On the Sphere was widely read and frequently copied. Indeed, between 1472, which is about 240 years after its uh, original writing, passed around in manuscript form uh, at that time, in four, between 1472, when this little book first found its way into print, and 1673, it appeared in approximately 200 editions. You wish your last book did that, right? No. Including several published in Wittenberg during Luther's lifetime. And there were at least 30 vernacular translations as well. 30 languages. I'm not sure about the languages. 30 translations. Wildly popular, On the Sphere seems to have been a book that everybody read, not just professors and their students in the universities, but also interested readers of every kind, including those who did not know Latin. He then offered answers to such questions as the nature of the circles on which the spheres run, the east-west rotation of the skies, and the spherical nature of the Earth itself, which accounts for the differences observed in the night sky depending on one's geographical location, as you can see in this illustration uh, from one of the editions. Along the way, he easily refuted the primitive notion that the Earth is flat and offered proofs of its spherical shape from, for example, the viewing of a distant shore from the top as opposed to the bottom of a ship's mast, line of sight. Perhaps more importantly, though, the traditional cosmology of the spheres also formed and informed Christian imagination, which, following the work of Pseudo-Dionysius on the celestial hierarchies, had densely populated the heavens 
with angelic beings of every kind. And if you know Dionysus, you know you have choirs of angels with ranks and so on, and they sort of go up and down uh, along with the spheres. Sacrobosco's On the Sphere remained in print, and the vision, Christian vision of beauty and order remained intact until well in the modern period, after which it was dramatically eclipsed, nice word, first by the work of, I did that by accident, first by the work of Copernicus, and later by that of Galileo and Kepler. Luther almost certainly knew On the Sphere, and he clearly had read several other cosmological works as part of his Master of Arts study in Erfurt. He also heard lectures in natural philosophy there, and the evidence suggests that this took the form of a rather robust philosophical exploration of the spheres of the heavens. Luther's lectures on Genesis show that he knew cosmology very well and that he assumed it in his reading of the creation. In the classroom, Luther addressed many of the traditional questions, including, again, the quality of the heavens, their firmness, material out of which they're made, the character and stability of the waters, Moses' positions in the heavens, and so on. He also discussed more than once the spheres themselves. He considered questions about the planets and their motion, and he raised the issue whether the stars are intelligences answering in the negative. Astrologers, including not a few Dominican theologians, nobody from uh, the seminary here today, <laughs> had answered that same question in the affirmative arguing that God makes use of the stars as secondary causes that influence people and bring about important events. Against such claims, Luther argued that the movements of the stars are not the cause of human events, even if God often makes use of them as signs of important events, as one sees, for example, in the star that heralded the birth of Jesus. Luther's cosmos, we might say, was medieval, but also profoundly theocentric. The one God is radically present for Luther and active throughout the created order, the hidden cause which in a moment by moment creatio continua upholds the whole creation. It is he and not the heavenly bodies as secondary causes who moves all things toward their appointed end. The issues are too complex to, uh, to explore here today, but Luther's radical theocentrism has its roots in Christian Neoplatonism, and his rejection of both astrology and the notion of secondary causality has parallels in other theologians of his time. In short, in his cosmological convictions, Luther was comfortably medieval, even if he often expressed himself more forcefully than others. And he was in no hurry to change either. Asked, for example, in the 1530s about the work of a new astrologer who would argue that the earth revolves around the sun and not the other way around, presumably Copernicus, the record doesn't say, Luther answered that the man was a fool and that his theory would upset the whole science of astronomy. More to the theological point, however, Luther opposed the uncertainty of a newfangled astronomical theory, no matter how brilliant its proponent, to the sure witness of Holy Scripture. The Bible, Luther noted, clearly supports the geocentric view. For example, in Joshua 10, where the writer reports that during a battle at Gibeon, the Lord commanded the sun and moon, and not the already stationary earth, to stand still. Theology, for Luther, is the queen of the sciences, because the knowledge Scripture provides is sure and certain, while the findings of natural philosophy, what we would call the natural sciences, offer only a probabilistic knowledge, that is, one which is always subject to revision and correction. Now we want to go down the rabbit hole in some of uh, Luther's uh, reading of the uh, creation account. So Luther was Ptolemaic in cosmology. I have this nice picture here. This is done by a painter named Prechtel. And, uh, I think I know what it's supposed to mean, although I, don't, I think Brechtel is one of those kind of painters who doesn't like tell you what the painting is supposed to mean. I know the sort of standard reading of it. I like it because Luther seems so enigmatic. He seems to look at us in a way that we re I, I really don't know. How do I stand with him? Uh, and, and so I do like this. It presents the man a little bit more as a mystery and less as the sort of paragon of you know, great Protestant tradition or something. Uh, more as a guy that we really just try and figure out. I hope he is still that. I think he is. 
So Luther was Ptolemaic in cosmology, but he asserted the certainty of theology over against the merely probable knowledge of the natural sciences. Considering his flat rejection of the Copernican worldview, moreover, it would seem that Luther situated himself firmly on the side of a biblicistic and even fideistic position that looks to ground the knowledge of God, not in nature or reason, but in the Bible alone, no matter what nature and reason may seem to say. And indeed, it would not be difficult at all to collect sayings from Luther that pit natural knowledge and human reason against revealed truth and faith in God's word. In a fallen world, it is safe to say, Luther did not believe that human beings can discover the most important theological truths directly through the study of the natural world. Reason itself, he would readily admit, is the highest natural gift given to humankind, but for that very reason, it is also subject to the most profound abuse, especially when fallen human beings use it to reason their way to being righteous before God apart from repentance and faith. Reason in this sense is what he sometimes called Frau Hulda, the prostitute who can't or won't see her own worth and dignity and so sells herself to the devils and thus becomes the means by which sinners attempt to justify themselves before God. Sin perverts even the highest virtue and puts it to the service of the greatest vice. Still, even with reason's fallenness in mind and in a sure echo of Romans 1, for Luther, the fallen human being, can know at least that there is a God. Only the fool says in his heart anything different. The problem for Luther is that this knowledge doesn't get the sinner very far. The question for which one really wants an answer is not the ontological one, whether there is a God, but the existential one, how do I stand before this God? Neither reason nor the study of nature can give us the answer to that. To the contrary, the fallen sinner who looks to nature to find out about God will on Luther's account meet only the God of wrath. Luther's God hides himself under the cover of nature, using it as a mask to conceal his true identity and purpose. The natural man who looks for God apart from Christ will not be able to find the God of grace and mercy. As Luther himself memorably put it, quote, the philosophers argue and try through speculation to break through to some kind of knowledge of God, even as Plato recognizes and acknowledges divine providence. But all that's just external. It's not yet the knowledge that God cares and that he hears and helps the afflicted. This Plato cannot say. He remains within the limits of metaphysical thought, like a cow staring at a new gate." End quote. There's a lot of fun to read. Apart from Christ, therefore, the would-be human knower can learn some things, at least provisionally, about the God who made the world. Plato, it seems, knew about God, divine providence. So the fallen human being can know that there is a God and that God is somehow moving the cosmos forward. But toward what? And with what implications for me? Is the truth about the divinely given order and purpose of the cosmos opaque to reason, to be known only by faith? We find intriguing answers to questions such as these in the Genesis lectures. Let's look first at what Luther thinks about the divine act of creation itself. In his remarks on Genesis 1, 1 to 3, which reports that God created, but also that it was formless and void, Luther puts to work the Aristotelian distinction between materia prima, first matter, and materia secunda, second matter, using these concepts to make sense of this tohu and bohu. In the vocabulary of later medieval philosophy, first matter denotes the unformed stuff out of which all things were afterwards formed into actual things. Luther leans on this concept to explain what Moses means when he says that the original creations, the heavens and the earth that had already been created in Genesis 1.1, was tohu and bohu. Tohu, he indicates, could be translated as nothing, whereas bohu means empty. The undefined mass of the original creation, materia prima, he says, was surely created out of nothing. 
following its creation by God. It was real and existing. However, it was as yet empty of reality as anything in particular. Therefore, the materia prima of the first creation, even though it exists, could still rightly be called nothing. To put this in the language of scholastic philosophy, materia prima existed only as a pure potency, a capacity to become something which has not yet been actualized as something. Actual things, as Luther sees the matter, came to be only when at last the word of God created them out of the raw material of that first as yet nothing in particular. When through the word materia prima has been given a form, then it becomes materia secunda. Therefore, it is something truly new, a previously non-existent reality to which God has given definition and concrete shape. If you are keeping score, you can see that God has now created something out of nothing twice, both in the creation of materia prima and in the formation of materia secunda. I'm not here, by the way, to defend this notion. I'm reporting, okay? <laughs> Thus, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm not an Aristotelian. Thus, there is a twofold sense in which God created all things ex nihilo. Now, I want to take a little excursus here and just uh, work on this concept for a second, okay? As an aside, we can note that Luther's twofold understanding of nothing, believe me, try and write a book on nothing. <laughs> it's hard. There's a 500-page German study on the concept of nothing written by a wonderful Finnish fellow named uh, Zemele Juntunen. And uh, it's complicated. <laughs> it turns out to be very hard to define you know, exactly what you're doing. <laughs> so Luther's twofold understanding of nothing here sheds some light on a traditional impasse. Didn't you say, Tom, that I was supposed to know something about ecumenical theology? I, I thought you said that. Let me try. This uh, twofold understanding of nothing sheds some light on a traditional impasse between Catholics and Protestants concerning grace and nature. Does grace perfect or does it destroy nature? Luther often seems to say something like the latter when he claims that God's justification of the sinner by grace and through faith alone is a creation ex nihilo. The sinner, in becoming aware of her sin, is utterly negated brought down to nothing, and only then recreated, as it were, by God's word of grace and forgiveness, which brings the gift of the Holy Spirit and the indwelling Christ. Luther's Catholic critics have long rejected this account of justification on grounds that grace does not destroy nature, but rather perfects it. But if we reframe that question within Luther's concept of a twofold sense of creation ex nihilo, then grace would perfect and not destroy nature precisely by forming the nothing of fallen human nature, which lacks utterly the form of righteousness, into the form of Christ. Let me try and tighten up the analogy. Luther sees the fallen sinner as formless and void, the materia prima of justification, if you will, that is, a mere potency. Elsewhere, he speaks of this potency as an aptitudo passiva, a passive capacity for being seized and acted upon by God. Grace, therefore, is a divine word that acts upon that passive capacity and so forms the sinner anew as a man or woman of faith, reconciled with God and ready at once for the process of putting to death the old Adam and so becoming holy through and through. Grace recreates the new nature out of the materia prima of our fallen nature and afterwards works to perfect it. This is a solution to the problem, by the way, that could not be seen so long as scholars refuse to recognize that no matter how often the young Luther may have bemoaned Aristotle's influence in theology, and no matter how hyperbolically he may have insisted that one becomes a theologian, not with, but strictly without that rancid philosopher, his words, nevertheless, Luther himself remained until his dying breath an Aristotelian. As Otto Scheele noted over 100 years ago, quote, even in the last years of his life, he thinks in 
uh, in the concepts of Aristotelian physics. Indeed, the conceptual terms of his natural philosophical world remain Aristotelian, end quote. That is true, I would add, not only in terms of Luther's way of thinking about the natural world, but also his way of thinking about God and salvation as the above exploration of nature and grace suggests. In this regard, I wish you were here, Scott Manage. Heiko Obermann was perfectly right. Martin Luther was a child of his time. Returning to the Genesis lectures now to test whether Luther finds the creation an arena of love and reason, we find him puzzling why it is that in the first act of creation, again, Genesis 1.1, one does not find the words, and God said. Why? In a word, intelligibility. The prima materia of the first creation was unintelligible. It took shape as recognizable things only by means of its formation through God's word and God said, as we read regarding all the acts of creation that follow. These secondary acts of creation ex nihilo result in the production of specific creatures to which God gives not only existence, but also meaning comprehensibility, spoken into existence by the word, they become, no, they are words of God. And so it happens. In the remainder of Genesis 1, on each of the days of creation, God forms creatures by speaking a word that calls them into existence out of the nothing of materia prima. These newly formed realities thus come into being as words of God, including the original human pair. Moreover, the words of God spoken in the act of creation are for Luther anything but mere grammatical designations, grammatica vocabula. To the contrary, every created thing is a letter, or better, a word spoken by God. Quote, thus, the words of God are things, not empty letters, end quote. Luther's reading of the way God speaks the creation into being has quite accurately been read as his own version of the so-called speech act, in which the divine speech is not mere words, but an act that accomplishes what it says. True enough, I would say, but it is also much more. The divinely spoken realities of the creation are by that very fact, that is, that God has spoken them, both a wonder in the sense that God's act of creation is, shall we say, full-on miraculous, and at the same time, they are the foundation for the intelligibility of a creation that itself answers back to God in intelligible speech. The creation, so Luther, praises God. Thus, as Steve Tyra has shown, Luther provides a protological starting point for Paul's assertion that the whole creation groans as in the pains of childbirth, waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. Stepping away from the Genesis narrative for a moment and turning to his exegesis of Romans 8, we find him interpreting this groaning as a sign of the crea uh, creation's martyrdom by which it is made to serve the unworthy, that is, humankind, as fallen and sinful. The creation cries out under the burden of we human owners and our false dominion. When it does so, it points ahead of itself. It leans eschatologically forward toward that good last day on which it will be released from its bondage to decay. The groaning of the creation is the creation's own speech spoken back to the God who spoke it into existence. Creation is a dialogue. Thus for Luther, Adam and Eve, and remember that they are also creatures. Adam and Eve were like all creatures, created words of God, spoken out of pure potentiality into the actuality of existence by God's uncreated word. In the pristine newness of the first world, human beings found nature itself alive, intelligible, and just so perfectly transparent to its maker. The creation effortlessly mediated not just the knowledge of the creator, but his real presence as well. What does this mean? Adam and Eve did not have to wait for God to speak in order to uh, divine the meaning of the creation. In their original perfection, humankind, both the male and the female, 
uh, in their original perfection, they could see through the natural world to their creator. For readers accustomed to Luther's emphasis on the word of God spoken and the ears as the organs of faith, this emphasis on what Adam and Eve could see comes as a surprise. This can be understood in Aristotelian terms, and Luther does do it this way. Adam and Eve could perceive in and through each created thing, including their own bodies, its final cause. The final cause is not, moreover, remote from the created thing, but present and active within it. Indeed, Luther says that the original human pair understood the creation perfectly, that is, completely. The divine command that they should have dominion over the creation could be fulfilled only if they had a direct knowledge of its origins, destiny, and inner workings. This knowledge, Luther figures, was included in the image of God. Quote, no creature knew the creator like this and knew whence and why it had been made, end quote. David Yego has plausibly interpreted Luther's reading of the creation as deification. This is a topic, by the way, I have not pursued in this lecture, and there's a lot more that could be said about that. It's really quite fascinating. The knowledge of God for Luther is replete in the creation and in the minds of unfallen humankind. Adam and Eve, in their original creation, were deified precisely in the sense that they were suffused in mind, body, and soul with the knowledge of God. Let's say it this way. If God is real and present in every creature, he's real and present within them as well. When Eve looks at Adam and vice versa, they see God. Put differently, their own knowledge of nature, including their own nature, was fully theological. Every created thing lifted their minds and hearts effortlessly to the knowledge and enjoyment of God. However expansive the earth below, however vast the heavens above, nevertheless the two ends, so to speak, the human being down here and God up there, stand in a real union and communion made possible by God's radical self-presentation through created things. The gift of God's very self was given to our first parents by virtue of their creation as words of God made in his own image and likeness. Luther's God, then, is immediately present to his creation by means of created things. I think I said something there that's kind of weird. <laughs> I'm just going to leave that. Adam and Eve knew God, and paradoxical as it may sound, they really knew God. Through the mediation of created things. Luther is not content, however, to rest with that assertion, and here we note the speculative quality to his thought. Note well, Luther is not speculative philosophically, but as a mystical theologian. Might it have been, Luther wonders, might it have been that Adam and Eve could also see and know God apart from creaturely mediation? Could they see God directly? Luther is not sure. Perhaps, he says, God appeared to Adam uncovered. Luther does not decide this question, but leaves the possibility of direct knowledge of God open, simply it seems, because one should not arbitrarily limit the gifts which the good God may give, even the gift of direct divine knowledge. And in any case, gazing on the creation and in response lifting their eyes to the creator, Adam and Eve became precisely what God had made them to be, namely his own image and likeness put somewhat differently. Adam and Eve, the world's first theologians and the preeminent philosophers of all human history, did not have to wait for God to utter an external word in order to have information about a God otherwise in, un, inaccessible to them. They did not have to wait to hear from God. To the contrary, everywhere they looked, everything their senses took in, they perceived the words of God from the humblest earthly creatures, creatures to the loftiest reaches of the spheres. I'm at the conclusion. <laughs> Clearly, Luther's interpretation of the original human couple's noetic situation prior to the fall emphasizes the perfection of their comprehension of both nature 
and nature's God. We have not explored here his answer to the question how the fall affected that, but we did note that he sees fallen humankind as in possession of the knowledge that there is a God, as well as the recognition on some level of divine providence. But what remains of the original human ability to read the words of the creation and so make sense of the order and structure of the world? Does the world of the fallen human being still put on display the love and reason of the creator God? My answer to these questions is here provisional, but it seems safe to say that Luther thinks of fallen human beings as still capable of recognizing most of the ways in which their world has been ordered. One thinks, for example, of Luther's clear assertion in his catechisms that one can perceive in the creation the benevolence of the Father, or of his equally clear assertion that marriage, the ordered relation of one man to one woman, is a structure of human life grounded in the creation and recognized by all peoples. He'd be confused today, wouldn't he? Not one that requires a special word of revelation. These convictions suggest that for Luther, the readability of the natural order in human life as gifts of God that mirror God in their inherent meaning and orientation toward love and flourishing has not been lost. To the contrary, divinely given meaning and loving purposiveness remain features of our world. And even apart from special revelation or personal faith, human beings remain capable of recognizing them. We ourselves, on the other hand, have been disordered and hence disabled from spontaneously seeing through the good gifts of the creation to their maker. We require a forgiving grace that overcomes our estrangement from God and then sets us on the path toward the healing not only of our hearts but of our minds as well until on that good last day we once again are enabled again to see through every intelligible feature of the creation to the God of love and reason who brought it forth. I'm not quite on the screen you see an image created by a man named Budasi. This is an image of our cosmos, not Luther's. Though as you can see, it looks a lot more like the traditional image than you might expect. The similarity is caused by Budasi's ad adoption of a logarithmic scale for portraying cosmic realities outward, so to speak, from our solar system through the Milky Way, the innumerable galaxies, and onto the plasma and shock still emanated, emanating outward from the Big Bang. I show you this image for a single reason. C.S. Lewis bemoaned the fact more than 50 years ago that we have not managed to replace the discarded image of the cosmos of Luther and the classical tradition. Budasi's image, unlike others I have seen, suggests order, structure, meaning. But it's just a picture. It's just a suggestion. The task of re-rationalizing, if you will, our cosmos remains for us to do. The work of theologians like those involved in the creation project is therefore urgent, essential, and it has been an honor for me to make a, co a small contribution to it. I bid you peace and good hunting in Christ. Thank you. <laughs>